Hello, I'm Mark Steiner, and welcome to the Mark Steiner Show right here on the Real News Network. It's great to have you all with us once again. And we're going to start today exploring the life of one of the most politically radical basketball coaches in our history, Georgetown's John Thompson, who took on the racist sports power brokers to change the nature of college basketball, fighting racism and everything else along the way. He wrote an autobiography called I Came as a Shadow. And we have a fascinating conversation with the man who wrote it with him, Jesse Washington. Then one of the most stunning new TV programs is the dramatic reading of ta Coach's book, Between the World and Me. It's a powerful, emotional, and deeply political performance produced and directed by the Apollo Theater's Camilla Forbes, who joins us for the conversation. You don't want to miss either one of these. They're really deeply political and deeply important. But first, now I came as a shadow. Now, one of the most political, pedagogic, and pioneering college basketball coaches of all time, who faced down racism and challenged the nature of college ball itself, was Georgetown coach John Thompson. He was always larger than life, and not just because of his booming voice or because he was six foot ten, but he was a mythical figure in his birthplace of Washington, D.C., throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, who put the Big East division on the map and would become ultimately one of the most hated and loved coaches of all time in this country. And he transcended basketball in a city that was predominantly black. Many DC residents thought Georgetown was an HBCU because Thompson's commitment to leveling the playing field, recruiting the best players who had the least resources, who had looked out for young black men in this community and in the world and in this country. Ultimately, his commitment was to teach his players life lessons off the court, using the court as a way to teach and he fought the discriminatory practices of the NCAA. He saw basketball as a vehicle for teaching and making change politically. He died August 30th, tragically, at 78, and we lost an icon, an unapologetically black coach, the first to win a Big East championship in 1984, and someone who had his commitment to uplift us all. And here to talk with us about his life is Jesse Washington, who's a senior writer at Undefeated and co-author of John Thompson's autobiography, I Came as a Shadow. And uh, he's anything but a shadow. And Jesse, welcome to the Mark Steiner Show. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So whether it's reading the book or if people know a little bit about John Thompson, he was one of those guys who was extremely particular about lots of things. And... Um, some say he even put Bill Russell to shame with his particular way of wanting to do things. And he didn't suffer fools gladly. I'm not calling you a fool with this question. <laughs> but um, so talk a bit about how you got into this with him. I mean, because he really was a person who held things closely. He wasn't, he didn't kind of pour out his personal life. Um, a deeply intellectual man who felt, who, 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 who loved the kids he worked with. But he wasn't somebody who just automatically trusted and opened up. So I'm curious how you got into this in the first place, how you gained his trust. And, and he was known as a coach as giving his guys love, but also giving guys a really hard time. And I imagine he might have done the same with you. Yes, he did. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and that's when I felt like he really trusted me, when he started to treat me badly and mess with me. Um, so... Coach Thompson, a few years ago, he and his children, at the urging of his children, he decided that he wanted to write his autobiography. And he decided that he wanted to talk about things that he had never revealed publicly before, how he felt about certain situations, why he did the things that he did. So they set about looking for someone to write the book. And I was one of a pool of candidates who got to go in and sort of interview with him. Went to his house, had a conversation with him and his son, uh john the third and his daughter tiffany and he was definitely testing me and pushing me and poking a few uh jabs in my direction during the this interview that we had i remember him asking me i had worn you know like a polo shirt and some sort of casual pants to the interview and he said why did you dress like this to come here <laughs> now he didn't say anything pejorative about how i was dressed he said why did you dress that way and then he he gave me the look and that was the first but not the last time that I had the look. And it looked like he was looking into you when he stared at you like that. I said, coach, this is who I am. So I figured you might as well get, you know, I might as well be honest with you up front. There was no reaction or anything, but I did feel like I had passed a little bit of a test. Um, several months into it, uh, I asked him if he had a hard time trusting people. We've been working together for about three or 
four months. He said, yeah, I have a hard time trusting people. I don't trust you. And he gave me the look again. <laughs> but over time, he did come to trust me with his story. And I think that the moment that that happened was after we had written some things and he gave it to people who knew him very well to read and ask for his their opinions. He was a very collaborative person. He always asked people what they thought. And it wasn't rhetorical. He honestly wanted to know. And those people said, Coach, this sounds like you. So uh, once he figured out that I could recreate his very unique and thoughtful and intellectual yet uh, street savvy style of speech, once he knew that I understood what was important to him and how he wanted to express it, that's when the trust came. But I did always feel like I was one slip up away from having to run some suicides or something or <laughs> <laughs> uh, while we were doing the book. I'm sure you did. I mean, I, I obviously never met him, but I can imagine just watching him. But let, let's set the stage for just a second. I mean, I think that um, when you think about John Thompson, uh, there are some people who are watching this broadcast who may never watch him coach, they, people who were, weren't alive when he coached um, and when he ran the Georgetown team. And he was at presence for all that time uh, in that league and was, you know, the, 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 there was no black coach like him before that in a major school like that. Um, so t just, just set the scene for us. I mean, this is a man, as you, write, as you all write about in the beginning of the book, who grows up in, in, in Washington with a father who could not read or write, but who was still brilliant, a mother who was a school teacher who had to clean floors because of segregated schools. She couldn't get a job. Um, and he grew up in this very loving, powerful home as well. Um, and despite the segregation racism around him, he, he would almost, you didn't know it because you had a world you lived in. So talk about who this man was for a second and what this meant that he became the coach of Georgetown. That's a great question. So the, the first thing we have to remember is that this is a man who grew up in legalized Jim Crow segregation. Uh, Maryland was a slave state. His father's people were from Maryland. His father grew up in a rural area, not even 60 miles from Washington, D.C., but had to go to work at a young age and never learned how to read or write. Um, his uh, coach said, my father couldn't spell John Thompson. Uh, his father was John Thompson Sr. And his mother was a trained teacher. She had a college degree in teaching, but could not get a job as a teacher in segregated D.C. and so had to clean people's houses to scrub floors, to wash toilets. And also, these are the two people who he credits more than anyone else with his success. And so you can start there. That's a very deep and profound foundation for someone to see these extraordinarily intelligent people because his father was no dummy, not at all. His father taught him many lessons that were incredibly important to him that he applied very specifically throughout his career. His mother also, and these two people to experience the oppression that they did. For him to grow up in segregation, having to sit in the back of the Catholic church when he was a kid because it was segregated, having to take communion second, that is the foundation of who he was. And he knew that he had to uh, look past it as times changed, but this is how he grew up. So then the, the two figures that I think that really illustrate sort of how he straddled and was a pivotal figure in American history is that he graduated from high school in DC in 1960 as one of the most highly recruited players in the country, was recruited by all the big schools, but not Georgetown, because Georgetown was, its basketball team was still segregated. So he went to Providence College. He liked Georgetown. He said, I knew the coach, the coach liked me. He played in high school at Georgetown all the time, but he could not be a member of Georgetown's basketball team in 1960 because he was black. In 1972, 12 years later, he became the coach of Georgetown University. So if you think that Georgetown was really ready in, those, in the interim, in, in the interval of those 12 years, if you think that America was really ready to go from not allowing people to play in certain colleges to having them coach these prestigious white universities in 12 years, no way. America was not ready for John Thompson, but he made them ready. And this was the environment that he stepped into. Yeah, and that's really important. I'm glad you brought us to that point. So I want to jump into where, what happened at Georgetown. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the book and his father had him grown up in St. Mary's County, which is in the east, the southern Maryland, um, a really deeply racist part of the state of Maryland, let alone the United States of America. You know, in, in St. Mary's, they have a they have a statue to the to all the men who have fallen in war. 
One side is for the white soldiers, the other side is for the black soldiers. It's Man. still there. It's still it's segregated. It's still there. It's still there. So, I mean, I, I, it's just, so that, that you know, it is kind of a little light into what his father had to grow up in and who he became. And I mean, one of the things in the book, is he says over and over again, is his dad told him, watch the white man. Right. Actually, he told him, study the white man. And that's some study. of the first You're right, right, man. I'm, study I'm sorry. Way. Study. That's right. right. And that's study. some of the right. first words in the book. And what his father meant by that, and he was very clear, was not fear the white man, was not ingratiate yourself with the white man. It was they have a world. Mind you, this is in the 1940s and 50s that his father and 60s that his father's son. White people have this world out there. Figure out how it works. Figure out what they say when you are not in the room and then learn to navigate those institutions. And I mean, boy, did he ever, because there was not many whiter institutions in Washington or in America than Georgetown University when he arrived there as the head basketball coach in 1972. Built on the backs of enslaved people. So um, so let, let's talk about that moment. So here he is in Georgetown, which had a terrible basketball team. Three and 23, I think, was the number that was there in the book about the, when he walked in in terms of this record. So, but he had, he'd get this reputation as this quote unquote polarizing figure, um, that he was intimidating and aggressive, uh, and that, um, that he, uh, you know, was a, they called him a racist. Many people did. And people, um, people, I mean, they know what they went through being catcalled from the stands, racist banner put up, uh, throwing bananas onto the court when Ewing played, um, it, it, all, all that that took place. Um, because his, his his players weren't supposed to be as smart, they were characterized as intimidating, and 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 that they were maybe good on the court, but they didn't have a brain. And so, let's talk about what he walked into and what he did there, and and how it, that that he it was like. You know, I thought about it as that as he when I thought about this and thinking about all that he went through, and I I thought about this as as him kind of building a team in a world that was full of black pride and black power, rising the sea of, of whiteness that despised him. That's a very good image, and I think it's accurate. So uh, to begin with, he started bringing black athletes to Georgetown. And this was just, it was a natural thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Georgetown was part of Washington, D.C., one of the blackest cities in the country. Washington, D.C. was the source of some of the best basketball players in history, period, point blank. But to that point, Georgetown had separated itself from black D.C. It wasn't really a part of it. When John Thompson arrived there in 1972, they may have had 100 black students total. And Georgetown was abdicating its responsibility to the city of Washington and their decision to engage with Washington, which was largely instigated by the riots of the 1960s when King and X were killed, they decided to do it largely through basketball and they hired John Thompson. And so naturally he brought black players there because he was from a black city. He played a sport where the predominant talents were black. As he says in the book, if I had coached a hockey team, most of my players would have been white. And a great line. Yeah. And, <laughs> and consciously or not, Many people at Georgetown and many people nationally felt these young black men don't belong at Georgetown. They don't deserve to be there. They're not smart enough to be there, both of which are false. And really, they felt that way about Coach Thompson, too. He doesn't deserve to be there. The only reason he got the job is because he's black and so on and so forth. These are things that people are still saying about us in these universities, mind you. But this was the level that he got it at that point was incredible. So the response to that once he got there was those things were vocalized to him uh, verbally, non-verbally, subtly, subliminally. And then at games, it was N-words all day from the crowd. It was, like you said, bananas being thrown on the court. It was a banner thrown through the his home gymnasium, McDonough Gymnasium, which still stands on the campus. In his third season, a banner saying, Thompson, the nigger flop coach must go. So this is what he's dealing with. John Thompson's children were in the in the gym and saw that come through the window. This is the environment that he's coaching in of extreme and pervasive racism, even in the sport of basketball, which we think is a black sport. 
still controlled by white people to this day, but that's another podcast. So uh, <laughs> exactly. Right. Another discussion. Right. So and then for somehow to the media and all of the people who are watching basketball to twist this around and say John Thompson is the racist when he is the one who's being subjected and his young people, these are 18, 19, 21 year old young men. They're the ones being subjected to the racism. And then John Thompson is the racist. Think about how he had to carry that and live with that and overcome that for decades. So in this book, finally, he's telling you how he felt about that. You know, he never could give that any quarter during his career because to acknowledge it would be to give them even a victory in some small sense. So he he shut it all down, but now he's finally telling you how he dealt with it and and how it felt to experience that. I mean, he would. This is important, really, because I mean, he really faced down racism and suffered the pain of racism, not just his whole life, which he did, but inside of Georgetown. And it was, I mean, and he stood up to it and he stood up to its subtleness. He stood up to its overtness um, and he confronted it. He didn't, he wasn't a shrinking violet. He didn't let it happen. Um, he, he called it out. He called it out. And he really, in, in, in that struggle, changed the nature of basketball from the time when he would, you can talk, be talking about, about this, from that, that arc when he was, um, when they had this crazy rule saying only X number of black players would be allowed to play on a college team. To the Proposition 42 was it 20 years later when he, when he walked off the court because they, they tried to implement rules that would limit the number of black kids that could come in because they didn't do as well academically because of where they came from. Even though he knew from his work that if you worked with these kids, they would academically succeed and be a great basketball team. Right, and he also knew, he knew that from his work, but he knew from himself. So let's, uh, let's fill people in a little bit about his history. When John Thompson was in el elementary school, he had a reading, and we'll get right back to this part of Proposition 42. When John Thompson was in, it was in uh, elementary school, he had a reading disability and was expelled from his elementary school, which was a white Catholic school run entirely by white nuns and priests. They told him he was quote unquote retarded. That was the unfortunate used word they used at that time and kicked him out of school. We can't work with you. We can't help you. You're beyond redemption academically. And so you have to leave. Now imagine John Thompson, someone with the intellect and intelligence that this man proved for all the world to see was almost cast aside. We almost did not get to see John Thompson because they thought he was too stupid. So then he went to a black school where a black teacher who he credits with saving his life, Sameta Wallace Jackson said, you're not stupid, you just can't read. And she got him help and taught him how to read. And so even after that point, he was academically challenged. This is one of the smartest people that we have seen come through American public life, but he did not have good grades. And he knew for sure that he was not a good test taker. And, and yet and still, because of basketball, he went to Providence College, got a master's degree from the University of the District of Columbia in, in counseling and guidance, and went on to be one of our greatest thinkers of, of the 20th century and of the 21st century. So if you get to Proposition 42, the NCAA tried to pass a rule for nefarious reasons saying, if you don't have a 700 on your SAT, you are not eligible for any athletic scholarship, period. And John Thompson knew that would have a disproportionate effect on black athletes because they, due to inequality in the schools from which they come from, poor schools educate you at a lower level in general than other schools. He knew that this would have a disproportionate impact on black athletes. It was not fair. And he knew that because he would have been one of those kids. And so he boycotted two games and forced the NCAA to rescind a rule that would have stymied and disappeared countless black athletes. You know, it, it's amazing how his story kind of, his history and his personal experiences and the people who influenced him, Sameta Wallace Jackson, his parents, really influenced all of these actions that we saw in public that we admire, but he credits them for teaching him how to react in these situations. And but you can see it in the way the book is written, that you can you can see John Thompson's continued growth. And I think that, you know, when people look at basketball, 
When people look at be black basketball players, when people look at coaches, that's the last thing they think about. Somebody who's a thinker. But when you even read what he wrote about basketball, he approached basketball like a go master, like a chess master. I mean, that, that level of thinking and analysis. And I think that's something, you know, he, and I really do think, and maybe you can, just, maybe you can say I'm wrong about this, but, I, but you know, we can describe it in your own words. But I think that he really helped change the entire nature of the game. Absolutely. You know, so uh, I learned so much writing this book. I learned about historical figures. You know, Mark, I consider myself a pretty well-read dude. Uh, I've read a few books in my day. I've studied a little bit of history. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you have. <laughs> and, yet, and yet somehow I didn't know the name John McClendon, who was a pioneering black coach who, who really influenced so much of what Coach Thompson did. So I got a lesson on John McClendon. John McClendon was one of the first people probably created the fast break style of basketball and the full court press. And, and Coach Thompson was very aware of the fact that when black people, when black players played fast, when they ran the break, when they when they pressured defense, People said, oh, look, they're wild. They're disorganized. Uh, they're, they're, they're undisciplined. Well, he changed that. He forced everyone to recognize, no, we are doing this with, with purpose, with structure, with principles. And yes, we're going to run this ball down your throat at the same time. But nobody could ever mistake his team for being undisciplined in any sense of the word. And that translated all the way down to how they looked when they walked into the arena to get ready for the game. Always jackets and ties, never traveled in sweatsuits. Uh, uh, and I'm talking, that tie was knotted, you know what I'm saying? So he, he deliberately knew and enacted this strategy to show people, hey, look, black people can be recognized more than, for more things than, than running fast and jumping high. We can be recognized for our intelligence. And that was why winning the, the being the first black coach to win a national championship was significant to him, was that, OK, now I can show other black people we can be recognized for our minds. He was deeply affected by growing up. All of his heroes were athletes. Elgin Baylor in particular was the major influence on his life. Elgin Baylor was a few years older than him in D.C. And he said, Black thinkers were not visible to us. He said, I grew up in the Frederick Douglass housing projects in Anacostia, but I didn't know who Frederick Douglass was. We didn't talk about him. We talked about Joe Lewis because he could knock people out. So all of these things and influences mixed up to his determination to show people, look at my team, look at how we play, look at how I talk and know that black people, we are intelligent and we gonna win some basketball games. He learned from so many other people, men and women, in, in, in school. He learned from coaches black and white, a red hour back, for God's sake, and in, in the Boston Celtics. And he, he, I mean, he, he you know, it's like, there's this thing about America where you take a man like, George, like, like John Thompson and say he hated white people because he didn't have a lot of white players in his team not realizing that part of that was because white players didn't want to come to Georgetown because there were so many black players and they, got, they went elsewhere. Um, but, but in his life, that's exactly the opposite of how he lived it. He was a man full of pride of his blackness, but his world was diverse. And he also understood what it meant to instill the pride and intelligence in these young black men who were undereducated, who came to Georgetown and left educated, not just basketball players. Very much so. You're exactly right. And OK, so John Thompson was a personification of black pride and activism and identity. And yet he had. By the end of his life, he would t he, he told me frequently, you know, Jesse, I probably at this stage do the environments I've been in. I have a lot more white friends, close white friends than I do black. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You know, and, and and he wasn't nobody's Uncle Tom. Like that is the last thing you would ever think about Coach Thompson. He said, "Man, all these people who call me racist, if 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 we got in trouble, if I had to call my people and you had to call your people, and I'm supposed to be the racist, I'd have more white people lined up to defend me in one day than you could get in a month." And so, really, this started with um, folks like Red Auerbach. Who knew that Red Auerbach was one of his most beloved mentors, one of his closest friends? All the stuff that they criticized John Thompson for and his coaching methods, 
He got it from Red. Who knew that Dean Smith was his, his uh, you know, probably the second biggest mentor. Dean Smith is the only person who John Thompson ever was an assistant coach for. Uh, he says in his book, I have gone through my life not seeking approval from a lot of people, but Dean Smith is somebody whose approval I sought. So he humbled himself before Dean Smith and Dean Smith because Dean Smith was genuine, because Dean Smith was smart and intelligent, and they had a, a deeply respectful relationship. Uh, the list goes on. Um, so many white people who he really treasured, white folks on his staff. And so, but this is the man who they said was racist. Yet and still, when they called him racist, he didn't go and throw that, oh yeah, well, I got white friends. He didn't, he didn't right. even no, bother right. to, right. I'm not going to dignify that with a response because I'm not going to make your criticisms of me prominent by addressing it. You know, it's funny, the thing that you talked about, the dynamic that, that by which he got to be called a racist. And he had something very specific in the book here that I'm going to read to you. So oh, please, basically, good. I was about to ask you that. Basically, basically, people thought he was racist because he had an all black team. How come you don't have any white kids? Well, little did they know that other coaches were going around telling white players that he recruited, oh, don't go to Georgetown. John Thompson is only recruiting you as a token. If you go to Georgetown, you won't play there. You know, he just wants you to come sit on the bench so he'll have a white face. Think about how hurtful that would be. You know, in, in addition to false. And so after a while, it got to this point, And this is what he said. Here's the thing about the complexion of my teams. I recruited who I could get. I was born, raised and coached in a majority black city. I worked in a sport with mostly black athletes. It was logical that my teams would be mostly black. If I had been a hockey coach, my teams would have been white. When I came to Georgetown, I had no problem recruiting white players until people started telling white kids I was racist and wouldn't give them playing time. After a while, I knew that if I were a white player, I wouldn't come to Georgetown either. Think about it. Would I, as a black parent, have sent my son to play down in Mississippi during Jim Crow? I wouldn't risk my son's future like that. Based on the way I was falsely portrayed to a white parent, I was Mississippi. <laughs> that that blew me away when he said that. Yes, it did me when I read it. Yes. <laughs> that blew me away. And that shows the way he thought. He thought through things on multiple levels all the time. He consistently surprised me with the way that he would analyze and break something down in a in a very layered and nuanced and looking around corners type of fashion. And that's one example. Yeah, well, of course, these parents, you know, I'm like Mississippi to the black man, uh, which is uh, a very interesting uh, metaphor, to say the least. He and his players all through the time, and some of these players became some of the greatest basketball players of all time. Some never played a professional ball, but most went on to do something. Um, as he told them all, as you over and over in the book, that you make more money sitting down than you do standing up. I mean, we forget <laughs> this man wasn't just a, didn't just change the nature of basketball. He was a teacher. Very he taught much these so. kids. Yeah, very much so. He considered himself primarily a teacher. You know, and uh, um, that was his main calling. And if they did not do something besides basketball, then he would consider that a failure. And that's what he told them. You know, you have to do something with yourself besides throw this ball through this hoop. And they listened to him. And actually, as we leave here today, talk a bit about, for just a second, the uncle he loved that the title of the book came from. And I don't know whether you want to read it. I'll read it which is the poem that, that actually inspired the name of the book. Yeah, um, thank you for asking. I would, like, I would like you to read it, Mark. And so, um, you know, Coach Thompson knew what the stereotypes were of him. And he also knew that he was in no way was those stereotypes. And he was attracted to people of a lot of different ilk. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't he had an uncle and his uncle's name, his mother's brother, his uncle's name was Louis Grandison Alexander. And he was a poet and a theater writer and performer and part of the Harlem Renaissance. And he made a profound impact on a young John Thompson because he had never met anyone before who made an impact and was recognized for using his mind. And that was the first person that, that probably planted the seed in Coach Thompson. Oh, we can think our way to greatness, you know? And so there was a poem that his uncle wrote that Coach Thompson knew by heart and recited to me 
early in the process of our writing. And then he didn't make a big deal out of it. And then later on, I went back and looked it up and he might've mentioned it again. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, coach, do you identify with the subject of that poem? And he just gave me the look like, okay, Jesse, now you're starting to understand. And the title of the poem was, I came as a shadow. Why don't you read it? I came as a shadow. I stand now a light. The depth of my darkness transfigures your night. My soul is a nocturne. Each note is a star. The light will not blind you, so look where you are. The radiance is soothing. There's warmth in the light. I came as a shadow to dazzle your night. And as this book does as well. So, Jesse Washington, thanks so much for joining us today. This was a great conversation. And thanks for working with him on this book. It's a privilege. Thank you so much, Mark. I Came as a Shadow, Autobiography of John Thompson. Really, really, really worth the read. Amazing book. And I first of all want to thank producer Erica Blount for putting all this together, without which this show would not happen. My partner in crime, uh, Seba Petuskin, who uh, edits this program. Uh, and today I want to thank the man in the studio who made it all hum and work, Cameron Grandino. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know you'll love what comes next. ta coaches Between the World and Me as a theatrical performance. We talk with its director and producer, Camilla Forbes. Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show, right here on The Real News. Good to have you all with us. In 2015, I interviewed ta Coates for his book, Between the World and Me. He wrote that book for and to his son, Samora. It's one of those books that makes you stop, think, feel, so when Between the World and Me came out as an HBO film, I was anxious to see what they created. Because this book is an impassioned letter, a warning to his then 15-year-old son meditating on being black in America, warning his son against state-sponsored violence against black body in our country. Now, our guest today, Camilla Forbes, executive producer, one of the executive producers and the director of the HBO adaptation, and also executive director of the Apollo, originally adapted this book to the stage then the idea emerged during what I understand is a weekly Zoom game night that she has with Susan uh, Kalechi Watson and ta to turn it into a Zoom reading. But then that somehow morphed into networks loving the idea and along came HBO and boom, you have a political, emotional, social and historical powerhouse with some of the greatest actors and personalities in the globe. Not just reading these passages, but living these passages, turning them into performances, into a heartbreaking, sweeping indictment of America's racism and the perseverance of black joy in our world. And as I said earlier, we had the pleasure of welcoming Camilla Forbes to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. She's, as I said, one of the creators, executive producers of Between the World and Me, and uh, is the transformational executive director of the Apollo Theater. And Camilla, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let me take one step back. For those who do not know this book and have not seen this performance yet, um, just try to very briefly kind of describe better than I just did what this book is and why you, ha you had to do this book. Sure. So it was exactly that, right? Um, in 2015, Tanahasi wrote this book, but it was in the form of letters to his son. Um, and it was in form of letters of what are the lessons that I can pass on to you about what it means to be Black in America in the age of Trayvon Martin to his 15-year-old son? There was something very personal about the writing. There was also something very expansive about his writing, about the book when I first read it. It was as if he put words in my mouth as um, um, a Black woman that I could not find of how to describe or contextualize how we got here in this world today. Um, and that's what I found in this book. Something also very personal because it was the, one of the impetus of, of ta writing the book was the um, murder of Prince Carmen Jones that was killed by the PG County police years earlier. And um, we were all students at Howard University together, um, you know, prior to his murder. So again, when we talk about, you know, this book, there was something very personal that prodded not only him to write the book, but I also think that led us all on this journey to make the film. Um, it was really an opportunity to have a much larger and broader conversation um, with many people all at once um, in the way that book 
reading can be quite solitary. Um, a film or theater can be something that's quite communal. Um, and um, this, this was that opportunity to have a very communal conversation. And it was that, you know, and I, I was thinking, I was thinking that you and, and uh, Tanahasi and Chadwick Boseman and, and Susan Kelechi Watson were all at Howard at the same time. So we were. How did that happen? <laughs> that universe put you all in place mean, at one time. <laughs> yeah, you know, we were we were all classmates and peers, and that's how and friends and family, and that's how we saw ourselves then, and that's how we see ourselves now. Um, and and I think you know this project, um, Greg Alvarez Reed, who was also in the in, in was part of what our cast um, was also part of that family um, at Howard. Um, Bradford Young was part of our family at Howard. I mean, this was these were our peer groups. These were the students that we were sitting next to. So this was something that you know it was a really just an extension of that experience um, and an opportunity to collaborate with one another on something that was actually quite personal um, for each of us um, um, and share it with the world. So one of the things about this, I mean, you know, there there are you you can do a book on tape. You can even read a tape in front of a camera on Zoom or whatever else. But there was something about how you all approached this particular book yeah. that was yeah. really very different. Yeah. And the people that came around to do this with you, I mean, it wasn't just a book reading. I mean, this was coming from deep inside, not just actors doing a part. It was like there was something very powerful about that, that, that process. Is that how you thought about it in the beginning? I mean, talk a bit about that. Absolutely. So, you know, the first step was really looking at this for the theater. Um, and and what the, the one of the first big challenges was looking at the book and then being able to break it down into monologues. We knew that we had to hang our hat on a sort of format. And so then looking at the book and the beauty of it was, is that's kind of how ta wrote it, right? He wrote a series of letters to his son. So it was just a matter of being able to organize and edit those letters into segments of monologues that felt as one singular voice, another monologue that felt it as another singular voice. And that's how we really started to sort of weave the web, if you will. Um, and then embrace the form of what does it mean to have actors um, um, read the work. We were at Sundance Lab um, workshopping this for the stage um, with two incredible actors, Greg Alvarez Reed and Michelle Wilson, who were in the film as well as several other actors. And um, being able to hear what resonated in an actor's mouth and body and what, what emotionally they were able to gravitate towards really helped with sort of the shaping of the language um, for the stage. Um, and that proved a really awesome um, playing field for then what it meant to be translated to film. We had an incredible team um, worked with David Teague um, to work on sort of what that that stage to film adaptation then also looked like. And it was, um, it was an incredible process, right? And I think a big part of the process was embracing the form. Um, in theater, we really embraced the, the the beautiful tapestry of language that Tanahasi had put on the page. In film, we were able to really embrace the visual medium of the visual images that he conjured through his poetic language and really leaned into that to, to have a bit of a visual poetry, if you will. So it was really an opportunity to kind of sit in and embrace each mediums um, that the work um, was was looking to swim in, right? So whether it was stage or whether it was for the film. So, you know, I, when, when you think of the folks that you worked with on this, or that, that worked with you on this as actors, Marshall Ali, Angela Bassett, Courtney Vance, Yara Shahidi, Angela Davis was also in it, Alicia Garza, um, and Olu Onosai. By the way, it, the funniest side to that one is that Erica Blount, who's my partner and producer on this program, who couldn't be here today, um, babysat them. <laughs> Small world. Um, but I, I'm curious, what... what, what Given that you were in the midst of, of we're in the midst of COVID, so how did you end up directing all these people in this, and how did you yeah. work with the actors to do this? I and mean, you had to be really distant, right? I had to be very distant, almost like we we're talking today, <laughs> right? Like I, I couldn't travel everywhere, so um, we had an incredible team of producers, um, you know, led by um, Elisa Payne, that um, really orchestrated shoots all over the country. So, you know, on the West Coast, um, we shot in six different cities. We shot in San Francisco, we shot in um, LA, um, Atlanta, DC, New York. 
but I couldn't be, I couldn't get on a plane because of COVID. So we were through, use Zoom technology in which I could see what the cameras were seeing and the actors could see me on a monitor. Um, it's the oddest way um, to direct, um, quite frankly. But I, but, but I will say what I did learn, I think through that process was a real opportunity of how do you get as concise as possible with your language? Um, if, if particularly with speaking to actors speaking to crew in the area because we didn't have the time nor the luxury of time or space um, where we can kind of ponder ideas. I mean, decisions had to be made very quickly. Troubleshooting had to be done very quickly. Direction had to be given very concisely, um, which is sometimes a different way of working when you're used to being in person with people and, you know, kind of wanting to kind of feel out the energy or feel out how, how things are moving. I didn't have that luxury. I could only see what the camera was seeing. Obviously, these actors are incredible. So you had to trust the actors, though, because you couldn't have spent a lot of time with them rehearsing and going over each line. I mean, that was something that that they they really had to embrace. Totally huge trust of the actors. I mean, in most cases we had it, you know, we had rehearsal sessions beforehand, um, but that's also on Zoom. So, you know, you're really trusting that, you know, you, the actor's instrument will 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 do what it needs to do. Um, and um, and you're, you're there to help to guide and to find moments and opportunities to give sort of the, um, this is the playground. This is the area in which we're playing within emotionally um, and, and allow them to go and, and hopefully find moments to unlock as well. I'm curious, you know, that, that your, the work you did at the Apollo, the work you have been doing at the Apollo and, and, and the kind of theater you're creating there and your um, intense work in, in, for a bit, one of a better term, the hip hop generation and the voices of, these, of, of the spanning generations in that art form how that kind of infused what you did with this? Well, I mean, I think it infused on um, sort of style. Um, I think when we think about sort of, you know, contemporary generation of defining oneself or refusing to define, um, you know, when I think of this work, it sits between many different sort of a hybridity, right? I even just describing it. Um, is it doc? Is it narrative? It's a combination of both. Is it visual poetry? Sure. <laughs> There's a little music video sprinkled in there. And, and, and I think that's sort of also indicative of when I think about my peers and my artistic peers, um, sort of that intersection of hybrids and multiple disciplines. Um, and, and, and how I think artists um, of today are, are looking to exist. Um, so um, I, I think this is an example of that. And I think also at the Apollo, um, we're also looking to create homes for artists in very similar um, that, that are, that are non-definable, um, that artists that exist in multi a multitude of spaces, of definitions, of disciplines. Um, and how do we as an institution sort of create a home um, where you may not just be a singer and, and not that a singer, just a singer is anything, but, you know, there may be other interests. So how can we be as flexible and as ambitious and innovative as an institution as our artists are? Um, and that, that's, that's where I think we're, we, we are looking to sit and to grow as an institution. You know, and I was thinking as you watch it, and I watched it again today, um, that the, the, the people, who, the, the, the people, the actors who are in this, they span the generations. Yeah. And inside of that was kind of the pain and power of the piece to me that that it, it spoke to people, whether you're 20 years old or whether you're in your 70s. Yeah. That that what confronts young black people and black people in general in on the on this planet every day. And yeah. so I, I mean, it was so moving. I, I was so talk a little bit about how the actors who chose them? Did you choose them? Did they choose you? Yeah. Did they choose the yeah. passages? I mean, how did this? I mean, it was it was such a deeply personal piece. It was it was extremely deeply personal, um, and you know, a lot of the actors participated in the stage production at the Apollo. Um, at the Apollo. Um, and so they already had an affinity with the piece. Um, we cast it and put a lot of ask out to folks, and I think to who those folks it resonated the most deeply, the most personal, um, came back and said yes. 
Um, we also were really intentional about wanting to have families. So we have Angela Bassett and Courtney, right? In the same film, they are a married couple, they are husband and wife, they are parents. Um, it was important to begin to really blur those lines. Um, there were several of us, um, like myself and my um, other executive producer, Susan Kalechi, had a personal connection to Howard University and also to Prince. Um, we were classmates. So there were a lot of, you know, we had other families like the Washingtons, Pauletta and Olivia Washington. That was also very important because, you know, this is a piece about family. Um, it's a celebration of family, but also, you know, what happens when life is lost um, in family, right? Um, and so to actual have actual families present um, was, was really key in the construction. But also on top of that, it was also strategic because um, we're in COVID. And if we wanted one or more actors on screen, you know, like in the, uh, the Washington scene, I, they needed to have been quarantining together. So, you know, and that it's mother and daughter. Um, so there were, there were, you know, when there were moments of sort of, I think, production challenges, we definitely found ways to create creative opportunities out of them. You know, there was also this, I said earlier about the cross-generational mix and all this. I mean, it kind of lent itself to this kind of universal story of resistance. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. And and I think you, you, we see that, you know, it's interesting. We see that really ring ring true in um, our Yara Shahidi and Angela Davis scene, right? Um, where you had multiple generations. Um, and, and the real purpose of that scene was to have an opportunity to echo, to echo this idea and theme of resistance um, that existed not only, you know, 40, 40 plus years ago, um, but also exists today. Um, and, 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 and it's almost as, a um, you know, one generation whispering to the next, whispering to the next, um, because that's how lineage is passed on, right? That's how power and purpose is also passed on is through these multitude of generations. You know, I think as you just said that uh, what popped in my head was like, how long does this damn whisper have to go on? I know that's, that's always the question. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, and I think what this is, the book really sort of, high, or the, the book, the film, is how do we also find the peace within the all of it? Because quite frankly, the whisper, the struggle, enjoy the beautiful struggle of it, right? Um, as as Tanhasi writes, um, because, and it's, it's even in Oprah's piece, the struggle is all I have for you, son. <laughs> That's all I have to give for you. I cannot make it okay. Um, and, and how do we make peace within the all of it? Because quite frankly, it is, it is the resistance and, the, and finding beauty and joy within the resistance um, that has allowed us to sustain and subsist for the last 400 years here in this country. And you know, maybe it's, and I know it is in some ways, the media and the digital world that we live in. But when this book came out in 2015, you know, America was facing reckoning with this kind of the police killings of Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and the uprisings that took place. And it seemed like the killings were like, it just, they became endless in the front of the people's eyes. Sandra Bland, Philandro Castile. I mean, I, I could go on and on for days, unfortunately. And, and, and then you saw the birth in the same time of all these new resistance groups like Black Lives Matter. And, 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 and so I, I'm very curious about your process and how you all wrestled with this with the kind of the, the pain and power of making this film. I mean, there's a, yeah. there's a, a, a horrendously sad timelessness to it all, but it's really relevant yeah. to this moment that we're struggling in now. Well, this moment is what I think also proved a sort of an urgent um, response to make it into a film for sure. But also I think part of the process, because we're very full aware about the fact that these images exist in the media, sometimes at nauseam, sometimes in a way that can create a sense of almost PTSD um, and re-trigger and re-traumatizing um, people. Um, and so as we were making the film, it was always how can we find those opportunities to um, um, have the conversation but not consistently re-traumatize people? Um, to have the conversation, but also within the context of um, resiliency and joy and that celebration as well. 
Um, and, and, and that was very much always sort of the counterpoint um, throughout making the film. I think it's also the counterpoint that I found through the beauty of the book and reading the book. There was always this celebration of, as we talk about sort of the warmth of the Mecca and the resiliency of the people that surrounded, um, as Tanahasi talks about in his mentor, that surrounded him in his memoir, that surrounded him. And, and, and so it was always visually, how can we make sure that that is just as present? And, you know, it made me also think about how this, this, the way you did this, the book does this too, but the way you did it cinematically and with the actors, that you really do capture the kind of innocence and joys of, 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 of black boyhood, but while you're also capturing the danger. I mean, that was this, to be able to do that creatively, it's not always easy to translate that written word into what you just did. Yeah, that is true. Um, that is true, you know, and I, and I think it's, I think the beauty and the complexity actually, I think are actually already existed within the language. We just had to find ways to stay true to the poetry that was in the language, um, as you've just stated, right? It's this idea of um, where looking at, you know, within an instant, innocence can turn to danger in, 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 in within an instant, um, particularly in lives of young black boys. Um, and how do we walk that line quite carefully? Um, and, and also, you know, and leading into sort of the, the duality of, 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 of what those two worlds present. You know, I was, you, Howard got a huge, we went, going back to being in a conversation, Howard got a huge shout out in this and I was. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. They really did. I know there were times where I was like, is this too much? No. <laughs> I, it was, and, and, and Erica Blount, who's she's she's on a short brief vacation right now, but she she went to Howard, who produces the show with me, and she she went to Howard. Both her, I mean, her daughters went to Howard, um, and so it was a big thing that we talked about the power of what that place means, and and the creative intellectual energy that it confronts America with with its graduates and people who attended. That's right. I love that you said that. Yeah, it, it, that is um, that's what Howard represented in the book, but I think also also um, represents sort of this creative intellectual home, and um, and a landing place, um, a place in which um, you know your own identity was further explored, defined, redefined, challenged, um, in in a, in a way and and affirmed. Um, and, and, and sort of, and, and there are very few places like that, I, I think in this, in this world. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost exists as its own, in its own little bubble. But at the same time, I think that there's Howards that exist, um, across countries in which, you know, communities in which we see ourselves reflected, right? So in those communities, like, you know, the streets of Harlem, like Brooklyn, you know, um, where you can see yourself reflected in the diversity of, of, of thought, of identity, of voice um, is also um, sort of risen to the top as we see like at Howard and these other communities. So in this film, I'm gonna a couple of things before I let you go here, so I, know that I don't wanna keep you too long, is that, um, do you intend, is this intend to like get this film out beyond HBO to get it to, schools to communities, whether these communities are, are, are black or Mexican American or white, whatever those communities are. I mean, do you intend to get this out there? Because it just, it seems to me to be something that is a teaching moment and how, you know, so few of us read books the way we should be reading books, but we do watch things. So is there an intention for that? That was a huge intention. It was a huge intention when we were even just talked about making this film. You know, one of some of the words that really resonate with me is this idea of democratizing access. Um, and so, you know, throughout this period over Thanksgiving break, we made sure um, and thankful to HBO that we were able to offer um, the film before the paywall. So you didn't have to necessarily have HBO to be able to view the film, but also even taking a step further, we're in heavy conversations around how do we make sure that educators across the country not only have access to the film, but access to supplementary curriculum materials to allow um, much further in-depth conversations 
teaching and learnings to take place in and around um, the topics that are presented. I was thinking about your cinematographer in this, Brad Young. The work was, was really well done. I mean, I and his work precedes him, but I mean, you had this an incredible creative crew. We had incredible, and I also should mention, you know, we had two incredible DPs, um, Christine Eng and Jerry Henry out on the West Coast um, that, um, you know, really that, that shot most of this. And they were, you know, and on, on the ground, my eyes and ears, <laughs> because like I mentioned in most places on the West Coast, I was never even there on set physically. Um, so to be able to have sort of that overarching translation point around what was the, the large creative goals and how then, um, you know, does a, a DP able to sort of translate that into their work has been, um, they, they did an incredible job, particularly shooting during a time of COVID when the restrictions, I mean, you can only imagine the kinds of restrictions that we were up against. Um, because we were shooting also at a time when a, not a lot of shooting was actually taking place in August um, right. of 2020. So there were a lot of restrictions on set, a lot of challenges um, that we had to overcome and be extremely flexible around. Well, at the same time, you know, try and be creative. This film, to me, the way it was done, given that we're in a moment in this country where for the first time in my lifetime, I think in all lifetimes in this country, there are more and more people outside the black world who are beginning to understand the depth of racism, what it means, mm. what it's done to us, mm. to all of us. Mm. And, mm. and that's why this film, that's why I asked you the question about getting the film out in, into, mm. into, into the world, because I think that the way it's done, you can't run away from it. You have to stop and listen to it. You have to watch it. You have to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there's something happens when the subject matter is presented in a way that is so intimate, but also, you know, part of our big, you know, one of the big discussions is how do we push this forward and not let people off the hook until we're ready. And by the, by the time about letting people off the hook is when the rolling credits start to roll. And, and so the, I, even just structurally, of, of how we were looking to create the film. That was, um, that was a big, you know, point of, of creating this sort of safe, intimate space. I mean, intimate in the fact that you're many times with an actor on screen, it's only you and that person, as if they were talking right to you on the other side of that screen, it's inescapable, right? Um, and the idea from the pacing is that it went from bop, 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 inescapable until the film was ready to let you off the hook and let you out of the gasp to, to breathe. Well put. So, uh, and, and, so you, and your new projects, I understand you are working on new stuff. The Soul, Soul Train, bringing Soul Train. Oh yeah, 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 there's that. There's definitely that. <laughs> um, and that's a little bit away um, only because of, unfortunately due to COVID, you know, um, making theater during this time is, is, Hard. is even more challenging. Um, so I, I, you know, we hope when we can ever get back in the same room again, um, you know, until then we'll continue, you know, our digital programming, which is what we're, we're, we're continually doing at the Apollo. Um, so, you know, uh, for the next spring, at least until the theater. Well, long live the Apollo is what I say. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's funny you're doing that because as I mentioned earlier, Erica Blount Danois, who produces and partners in this program actually wrote the book. Love, Peace, and Soul behind the scenes of America's favorite dance show, Soul Train. That's how we met years back when I interviewed her for the book. Um, nice. And yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project overdue. I'm glad you're doing that. That's right. That's right. It's time for sure. Well, this, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really I deeply appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. This was fantastic. I enjoyed it myself, Camilla. It says Camilla Forbes, and we'll send you all a link to it as soon as we get this up. And I uh, okay. really encourage everybody to watch this. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. So for producer Erica Blount and video editor Seba Patuskin, I'm Mark Steiner. Thank you for joining us here on the Mark Steiner Show today. Great to have you with us here on The Real News. And let us know what you think. Write to me at the email address you see scrolling across the screen, mark at therealnews.com, and I'll get back to you. Let us know what you think and also what you'd like to see. Have a great day.
and take care.